So thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, this is our second adjunct teachers in animal law webinar. And so for those of you who don't know me, I am Hannah Nabolsi. I am a 2L at George Washington Law School, and I will be the moderator for today's event. We are very excited to be continuing this webinar series with another star panel this evening. Um, and before we get into the introductions of the panelists, I would just like to give a brief overview of this webinar series for those of you who may not be as familiar with this project. So the Animal Law Program at GW Law School has established the Animal Legal Education Initiative, which strives to incorporate animal law as a standalone discipline within the legal academy. And this webinar series is intended to support those efforts by creating opportunities for adjunct professors across the country to connect and collaborate with each other. And we hope to also be able to provide you all with some academic resources and a support system that can help you all accomplish your goals within your institutions. So these webinars are truly intended to be conversational and they're intended to be a place in which we can all network uh, so to that end, please feel free to send any questions or comments in the chat as we move along. Feel free to also unmute yourself at any point if you have any questions. We also encourage you all to turn on your video if you're able and if you're comfortable doing so, as it's always great to be able to put names to faces. And finally, I wanted to mention that if you missed our first webinar from last month, that recording of the event is now up on the GW website. So please feel free to view that if you're interested in hearing about the discussion we had on having, getting, and keeping an animal law course. Also, today's event is being recorded, so that will also be made available on the GW Law website. And so feel free to reference back to today's discussion if you want to kind of review it, or if you have uh, anyone that you think might be interested in watching it, please feel free to share it as well. Also, I wanted to mention we have our third webinar scheduled for April 10th at 6 p.m. Eastern, and the topic of that webinar will be student empowerment and engagement. We will have some valuable student perspective to share during that webinar, so we hope that you all can attend. Now, moving on to today's webinar, uh, we will be discussing what to do with your animal law course, and we have a wonderful panel today, so I'd like to turn it over to them to give a brief introduction. And I will just go down uh, the way everyone appears on my screen. So why don't we start with Dean Hessler? Thanks, Hannah. Um, and thanks to all of you for being here. And thanks to my fellow committee members for helping organize this. Um, we're looking forward to a great conversation. I'm Kathy Hessler. I've been teaching, teaching in law school for over 30 years and teaching animal law for about 25 years. And so I've taught at a number of different schools. Um, and I'm delighted to be here as part of this conversation. Thanks. Thank you so much. Professor Ligman. Thanks, Anna. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. I'm Josh Ligman. Uh, the important thing for purposes of this panel is I am an adjunct law professor with GW's animal law program. I teach a course on crimes against animals based largely on my experience as a prosecutor who focused on animal cruelty offenses in the Bronx, New York. Thank you so much. Professor Baboski. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. My name is Shelby Baboski. Um, and for purposes of tonight, I am considered an adjunct professor at the um, SMU College of Law. So in the fall, I teach animal law. And then in the spring, I teach wildlife law. Um, I've been teaching for approximately nine years. And uh, the wildlife law class has really soared. Um, we started it in 2018, and I went from barely 12 students to now I think I have close to 40. So excited to um, get some great information from these other professors and, and learn from everybody here and also share my experiences. Thank you so much. That's so inspirational. And last but not least, Professor Carey. Hey everyone, thanks Hannah. Uh, I'm Rebecca Carey. I uh, am currently serving as special counsel at the Humane Society of the United States. Um, and I have also just recently begun teaching some animal law, um, both at George Washington University and George Mason University. Um, yeah, excited to be here, thanks. 
Thank you so much, everyone, for the introductions. So I'd like to start our conversation tonight by addressing first the topic of pedagogy. And specifically, I'd like to discuss how students learn. So students often have different learning styles, you know, verbal versus auditory versus visual. So my question is, what would you say that your teaching style is? And how have you been able to adjust your teaching style to make your teaching style more accessible to students with different learning styles? I can sort of start um, by saying that because I am new to um, teaching, at least teaching law, um, I think I'm still very much developing my style of teaching, um, but learning from um, other professors who I have worked with, um, including some who are on this call. Hey, Nancy. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I think that responding to student learning styles is, a, is very important in any kind of teaching you're doing. Um, so I think one of the hardest things about getting started in teaching animal law um, is coming in with sort of a certain idea of how class um, should run and how students might respond to the questions that you're asking or engage with the material. Um, and then they don't necessarily respond that way or they um, aren't all as excited about one of the cases you wanted to go over as you are. Um, and sort of learning to adjust um, on the spot like that, I think is, is something that's um, important and maybe comes with time a bit. Um, but I um, have really enjoyed thinking about a variety of um, learning styles and teaching styles, um, everything from sort of the more traditional running through case analysis um, to some less traditional things. Um, for example, something that um, Hannah, as you know, we're doing in a class at GW, um, doing sort of a, uh, a oral advocacy exercise um, that's going to involve a, a fun night of, of testimony and um, outside folks coming in to participate. Um, so yeah, I think variety is, uh, is key as, as well as responding to how the, how the students are reacting. Love it. This is Shelby. And you know, um, I agree with Rebecca. So a lot of second years and third years take my class and I 1000% use PowerPoints, pictures, um, clips, anything that I can get the students interested in animal law or wildlife law. And when they come into the class, I, I explicitly tell them this will be like no class you've ever taken in law school. Um, and it's really a focus on... At this point, they know how to read a case. They know what the issue is presented and all of that. So what I want to focus on is teaching them how interesting um, animal law and wildlife law can be and how it truly hits every aspect of their life every day. Um, so when we start every class, we go ahead for the first five and 10 minutes and we talk about issues that have happened that week. And that is one of, in, at least in their feedback, that's one of their favorite things is, um, for example, we recently talked about this amazing owl that was at the Bronx Zoo and he escaped a year ago, Flacco, and how he lived for a year. And uh, unfortunately, he recently passed away. But it was such a great discussion. And some students that, you know, are pretty shy or I don't think I'm going to hear from, um, they just get really excited and animated. And already it's a good way to start off the class. So mine's definitely different, um, but I can do that because they're usually second and third years. And I just want them to come away with a passion um, that I never was afforded to have in law school because I didn't have an amazing Nancy Perry or someone else, you know, teaching animal law at the school I went to. So I love visuals. Very important. Um, so I would echo a lot of what my co-panelists have said. The other thing I would add is, so my course is an experiential course, uh, it's sort of a, an animal cruelty course mixed with a trial advocacy course and trial work obviously involves a visual and auditory experience for whoever's participating, um, either passively or actively. And so a lot of that I think is inherently incorporated in the course uh, and the visual material can sometimes be things that would ultimately end up being transcribed. Like I'm a big fan of using acronyms, um, which of course you're writing on the board so students can 
see them and then they can write them down to paper and commit them to memory and then actually use them in their experience of doing a uh, direct or cross examination or a closing or whatever it is. So it's something to kind of jog your memory. Um, also incorporating other exercises that aren't necessarily part of the graded exercises. Um, so the way we, we do it in my course is, and I see a question, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, yes, I can, I can use example. I'll give a, an example of the acronym since this is related to what I said before I move on. Um, <clears throat> let's see. So there's a couple. So I, I, I do use, I talk about my kids as much as probably anyone talk with kids talks about their kids. Um, so I use my kids' names as their acronyms for my students. Um, but I'll give, uh, so I, I could give that as an example, or I could give an example of, um, we happened to hit the closing arguments lecture at Halloween time um, last fall. So uh, we use different um, acronyms to focus on sort of the different focus of your closing argument. So for example, and one example would be the um, actual, the how to close effectively as in the closing argument itself, which was ghosts. Um, so it was go hard or stop talking seriously, right? The point of a closing argument is, is to be aggressive and, and make an argument as distinguished from the opening statement. Um, monsters was sort of was the acronym for what you want the jury to do when they're back there. So like M for motivate, for example. Um, my, just as one example with my kids' names, my daughter is Hadley. So we used Hadley's name as an acronym for uh, cross-examination, which was here, anticipate. And this is, I can't do a, a cross-examination lesson in this uh, panel, so I won't explain everything, but it was, here, anticipate, deconstruct, lead, events, you stop. Um, so things like that, which hopefully stick with the students. Uh, and then the, the last thing that I was going to point to was, so we had graded exercises like direct and cross-examination, their closing and voir dire. Um, and then there were additional exercises we, we do in class that I think give another kind of experience for students, regardless of, I hope, how they best learn. And it sort of incorporates any manner of visual or auditory or, or what have you, which is um, we used actual testimony, public testimony from a case, and we worked backwards in the case. So they were only given uh, direct and cross-examination from the case. And then we had to pull out, or the students had to pull out what the theme and theory was and what was actually going on in the case. So they were given no context. So I think there's a few different avenues um, that can either incorporate both or expose students who are primarily best learning in one manner or another to A, learn through the, the means by which they're used to learning, and then also hopefully get exposure to a new way of learning. And hopefully that can assist them in, in other courses as well. Yeah, I, I agree with everything uh, that has been said and echo much of it. And I'll just add that... Um, there are a few things to be thinking about. People, I think, sometimes get nervous about like different styles and worrying about how to do things exactly right. And so my advice would be, don't worry, just try, like jump in, do a little bit. And a little bit is really all it takes. So the neuroscience literature and the educational literature says you just need like to break stuff up if you do something for 20 minutes and then you just do something for a minute or two. Right. You can do really short exercises or um, you know, you can put a passage up on the board or, you know, on the internet or whatever and pull something down and just ask people to look at it, to work with it. Um, so trying to sort of do a little bit of different things throughout the course, again, depending on how long your class is, it depends on what kind of class you're, you're teaching, right? So if it's experiential, this comes a little bit more easily. If it's a traditional classroom setting, it's useful to be thinking about also the culture of the law school, what students' expectations are, you know, and how far you wanna vary from what that is. And as Shelby said, right, giving them notice when you do that, you can say, this is a little different, here's why, and helping them understand why you're doing what you're doing. Even as explicitly as saying, I'm trying to accommodate different learning styles, right? And so I think being upfront with students, letting them know what you're doing and why you're doing it really helps. 
uh, it's also important to know what your strengths are, what your sort of teaching style strengths are. And you can lean into that, right? And then just sprinkle some of this other stuff. You don't have to become a different person, right? I think the best teachers are the ones who teach from who they are. And that, and then you can acknowledge, right? There are some things I'm great at and some things that I, you know, I don't do as much or I'm not as good at or I don't have as much experience in. So um, yeah, I think trying to think about what, what fits your class, what helps with your students, what works with the culture of the school um, and what works with you and then just, just trying stuff. And the other thing I'll say is that this group, um, the committee and this group, and we're trying to build this, this community People are great at sharing their syllabi, exercises, you know, mini bites, all kinds of stuff. So if you want to try something, just I think Gina's question was great um, in, in getting Joss to share what he does. And my guess is a lot of people are like, that's a great idea. I'm going to copy that. And that's exactly what this is all about, right, is to help make it easier for people um, to try these things. Thank you all so much for that insight. So we talked a bit about learning styles and teaching styles. Now I'd like to move towards course style. So my question is, what advice do you have for a professor who's trying to decide whether to teach their course as a traditional class, a seminar, or experiential class versus a writing experience? Well, I haven't taught a class that involves a standard test yet. I've only taught classes that involve um, writing exams at the end, having students write papers. And um, so far, it seems that that's been a really good way to get students engaged in the material that we're teaching, um, allowing people to sort of follow um, what part of the course speaks to their passions and interests, um, which I think is also perhaps a good way to get folks thinking about um, the possibility at least of incorporating animal law down the line in whatever practice they do, um, whether or not they go into animal law full time or not. Um, and it's, it's been a really good way to uh, engage with students um, about the types of things that, that they care about and uh, conversely to sort of incorporate more materials into the class uh, that they might be interested in knowing that they're writing about some of those things. I can jump in and say um, one of the places to start in thinking about what style, of course, you want to teach is what you're good at, right? So if you want to do a traditional class because that's how you like learning, that's how you like engaging, that's a really great place to start. And then strategically, another thing to consider is what does the school need? So one of the things we did in working with Josh is GW needs more experiential courses. And so we're hoping that that leads to not just animal law students being interested, but crim law students and people who are looking for these experiential opportunities. And so that helps the school. It makes it easier for the school to say, yep, we'll have this course and hopefully broaden and sort of as, as Becca was saying, right, the exposure to different students. Um, so I think thinking about your strengths, thinking about what the school needs helps you um, and thinking about where the holes are. Um, and if there's already an animal law course, you can you can kind of uh, work along with that. If there's nothing, then you have a clean slate and you can do some of what you want. And sort of in response to Jason's question about how do you break up the time in one of these courses in, in, in a long class period, there's lots of ways, right? You can do a quick animal in the news moment you can assign pre-assign students to do um, to do that or to do something else, like ask a question about one of the cases or one of the you know statutes or something and say, you or your team, right, is gonna have a few minutes to talk about this. And so you can do small bites, but you can also do those bigger. You can say, right, you guys are on. And so you lead us through. And, and when students are talking to students, it's a really different dynamic. Mm -hmm. And um, the the students don't lose interest as quickly when it's their colleagues, right? And so there's lots of different um, sort of tricks, right? To to bring in small exercises, bring in student voices. You can do a mini debate in the class, all right? You guys have all read the cases. I'm going to put you on different sides. We're going to argue it, right? Ad hoc, right? Or you can do stuff in a prepared way. So there's there's a lot of different ways to to access the material um, or to address the material in ways other than just sort of talking about it in the way that most of our law teachers, right, talked about it. Um, as, as Shelby said, right, you can use video clips, you can pull. Um, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of material, both 
animal law material publicly available now um, that you can pull pull out um, and just use in, in whatever way it makes sense to you. And Kathy, I would just add that, you know, I love what you said about what the university needs, because when I first started the class um, before COVID, it was very traditional. And then in seeing my students coming back from COVID, um, it was really like, almost like they didn't know how to talk. Um, I mean, truly, you know, like they were scared to participate. Um, imagine going through COVID your first year of law school, right? And so what I really focused on was that discussion aspect and making discussion part of their actual grade um, and getting kids talking again. I mean, sorry, kids, I call them kids, I'm 50. But, you know, getting students talking again and really that is the whole point of advocacy and being a lawyer is not being scared to talk. And I just found after COVID like, whoa, we really need to change this to a discussion type class so that they can practice their advocacy skills and not being afraid to say something stupid or make an argument um, in class. And also peers talking to peers as well. Um, you know, in my wildlife class, I have several hunters I have um, students that uh, their families own ranches. And so recently with the wildfires, um, we had a class recently where we talked about the wildfires in Texas. And man, these students really opened up about, you know, what their families either could have been going through if that was happening to them or what's happened to them in the past. So I, I changed with the needs as I saw after COVID um, to get kids start like communicating again and feeling comfortable doing that. I think that's great. And and to Gina's point, right, knowing what your students are kind of going through, what space, headspace and sort of, you know, energy space they're in is really helpful. There have been times I bring snacks in, right, if I think that's going to be helpful, if they're in a downtime, right, it's like, all right, here's some vegan treats. And and just the act really of doing that. And, you know, it's, it's a minute break, right, as they pass food around or get up and get it right. And that sort of reinvigorates them. So, yeah, all kinds of stuff. And I would just add that, um, again, echoing everything that's already been said, uh, I would also add that I think one of the keys, regardless of the, the style or the type of course that you have, is to really not, not be focused on one specific niche little thing, but kind of let students guide where the discussion is going to go. The great thing about law students in particular is that even the quiet ones have lots of opinions. So it's just a, a, you know, figuring out the way to get them to express those opinions and to contribute to the discussion. Um, and that's, you know, I've, I've found that that's often best done by just sort of leading the discussion initially, seeing where uh, that goes and then kind of asking what do other students think about that. Um, and, and if you have to, you know, asking a particular student what they think about that and then seeing where that takes the discussion as well. One other thing I wanted to add about sort of engagement of students and that relates to uh, the style of, of teaching and sort of the method of teaching um, is that I think one of the real um, benefits for students of having adjuncts teaching courses who are involved in practicing in this field is the amount of sharing we can do of our own experiences in our practice and incorporating that um, uh, into our lesson plans. So, um, you know, sometimes even if you're doing a, a class that has more traditional sort of case analysis, um, if you can tie that case, if it's not one that you litigated yourself into, um, you know, sort of practice tips or stories or ideas based on similar experiences you've had um, in litigation or otherwise, um, those tend to be the things that I've seen students get most excited about and most engaged with. Yeah. Thank you all so much for that wonderful conversation on pedagogy. I think that that was very helpful and very insightful. So I appreciate all your comments. I'd like to move our discussion towards the topic of methodology. And specifically, I'd like to focus first on papers versus exams. So with regards to exams, how much content would you say a professor should aim to put into their exam? And what are the best ways that they can determine what concepts they should include in the exam, knowing that some students are very new to animal law and also have limited time to complete the exam?
there's no way I'm going to echo everyone here because I don't do papers or exams. Um, we do. So we have uh, multiple exercises over the course of the semester. So the way my course is structured is students are given a fact pattern, sort of like what you would see um, in a typical final exam issue spotter. And then we use that as the case that guides the student exercises over the course of the semester. So I think I mentioned this before, they use those facts for voir dire, they use those facts for direct and closing exam or direct and cross examinations. And then they use that for a closing um, with the closing being uh, weighted most heavily since that's their third exercise. Um, and I think in terms of addressing how much to put in there, since I, I can speak a bit to sort of the way an exam course would be structured since it is written out in the same issue spotter way. Uh, I put a lot in there. And part of that is because since there's an experiential component to my course, um, it necessarily means that students, and I, I think this is not necessarily restricted to litigation style. I think this is useful in any kind of legal advocacy. Uh, students need to figure out how to tell an interesting story and get witnesses or potential jurors or whoever it is who's listening or participating on the other side um, engaged and keeping them knowledgeable without also sort of inundating them with information overload. So part of that is learning how to pull out what they need to synthesize it into a compelling story uh, and, and approach it from that angle. I can add really quickly um, that one of the things in answering this question that's helpful is going back to what your teaching goals are. And it's one of the things I think we all end up struggling with is there's so much, right, information, and we're trying to teach them all of animal law. <laughs> and you can't, right? And so if you kind of go back to what your goals are at the beginning, so you're going to have some meta goals, right? Maybe it's um, so in Josh's class talking about these advocacy skills, right? These are important um, and they're transferable and talking to students about that, right? And then you're gonna have some sort of medium goals. Like I want people to understand the trans, you know, the intersectionality of animal law. I want them to understand, right? That they need to be able to issue spot in the work that they're gonna do, I, you know? And then you may have some micro goals. Like I really want them to understand the challenges of standing. I may, you know, whatever it is. And so then you can try to frame your assessment, your sort of feedback, right? Whether that's on an exam or a paper um, around those goals, right? Giving students the opportunity. It's really, I think it's still hard for me. I've been doing this ages and it's really hard for me to let go of information, right? Let go of great animal stories in the news or these cases, we just can't cover all these cases. Um, and so there's also times you can say like, I'm gonna have you guys read all this, but we're gonna focus on a few things, right? And And then you can, uh, highlight those kinds of things in the exam. And again, I think the more we can tell students what we're doing in the class and how to be prepared for whatever assessment tool that is, like I'm gonna, you know, this is something that's really important <laughs> and it may show up on the exam, right? Those kind of cues I think are really helpful for students. Thank you. So then I'll ask on the flip side with regards to papers, what parameters do you think you should set for the paper in terms of length, topic, and type? So research paper versus a memorandum versus a brief. I'm happy to go. Um, I was going to try an exam one year and it was like, wow, I just couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't figure it out and what questions to ask and everything. So I've always done papers in both classes. Um, I definitely think you need to give them parameters uh, you know, even like I am incredibly specific, 15 pages, 12 point, um, you know, exactly even how footnotes are done, um, double spaced, all of that, because if I'm grading them all on the same, then they need to turn them in the same. And I had one year where a student had no spacing. It was pretty much a 40 page paper, but she got it into 15 pages and I realized like, wow, I really need to set this out better, you know? So 
I think going with that, I have 10 minutes where I go over in depth what I'm looking for in the paper, you know, introduction, summary, argument, um, and then conclusion. And I, I really love working with the students to get a topic that they're passionate about. And so I'm not strict. If a student goes down one lane and is like, I just, I'm not finding anything here. I say, let's work together and find you another topic. And I mean, I had a student um, I recently saw in the liquor store, but, um, and she told me she remembered the topic she wrote on. It was five years ago. And she said she's actually used it in her practice. So, you know, the point is to get the students passionate about what they're writing, again, making it that different course. Um, so they take it with them through the rest of their lives. But yes, parameters are incredibly important. If you don't put them down, um, you don't know what you're going to get. It can also be really helpful to students if after giving those clear parameters, um, you let them know that you're open to um, looking at outlines of their papers, um, it, even building in some time in class for <laughs> reviewing those outlines. Uh, I know some folks even will look at draft papers. Um, you know, you want to be consistent among what you're offering to, to all of your students, but um, that can uh, reduce the amount of surprises on the um, after they have turned in the final papers, though not always. And sometimes there are um, templates from your school um, about what's required for what's uh, average, right? For uh, for a brief or for a you know a paper or for you know depending on what the assignment is. And so that's also a nice place to start because it helps you feel like you're in the ballpark that um, that you need to be, and that students are not only being treated consistently, as Becca said, within the class, but across classes, right? Because you definitely don't want to be in the situation where you know, you've got a 25 page paper and other people have a 15 page paper and they're like, they won't take the class after a while. Right. So I think that's, that's helpful uh, for really big papers. I have found students have so many competing interests and it's just really challenging. So a lot of students wait till the end. Right. And so I actually require um, a title an abstract, um, then an outline, um, and then, uh, you know, if, if it's really big, then we'll do a draft and then a final um, so that they can get some feedback. And I talk to them about this is how lawyers have to work, right? You can't let everything go to the, so I'm trying to make that a, a learning opportunity as well. Um, but I don't do that for smaller, smaller ones. And there's also for smaller writing op papers in an experiential setting. So I did this in clinic. There's a chance for peer feedback. Um, and again, you'd have to let students know in advance and that sort of thing. So there's, I think, a lot of room for creativity, but there are there are helpful guidelines. Um, and it it is at first I thought I was going to have a, the opposite problem that Shelby, uh, you know, talked about, which is students are, you know, struggling to get to the page limit. And then you find out, yeah, they actually have they want to put a lot more in. So I had I have a window. Right. It's it's a page limit between, say, 22 and 25 pages. Right. And then with all the, the font and that sort of stuff so that so that we really are going to be comparing mostly apples to apples. Yeah. And the nice thing is there's um, legal writing faculty at all of the law schools. There's often writing institutes that you can share with your students um, that they can get help for their writing um, within the guidelines of the, the honor code. Um, and you can also talk to some of the writing experts within your your institutions to get some guidance about the culture of writing at the school, the expectations, like what have students already had in terms of what have they been taught about Blue Book or what have you, right? And then and then you can say, all right, I know you have Blue Book, so I'm gonna, this is a Blue Book assignment, right? And that sort of stuff. So yeah, again, plugging in because every school is gonna handle these things differently across the board. And it's helpful to kind of fit into whatever the, the prevailing culture is. Thank you so much. I'd like to pivot now towards, I think, a question that many law students have, which is grading. So what factors do you think should be considered in grading? Should the grade be solely based on the evaluation, so the skills practice or the exam or paper, or should class partici participation or other factors be considered as well? And if so, how heavily? Mm 
my opinion in my limited experience so far is that class participation is hugely important and uh, should be should factor into a grade somewhere. Um, I know that some I, I know professors who have had it as you know a specific numeric component of the grade. Um, other classes, you know, can bump you up or down half a grade based on your participation, but the main um, focus of the grade is the paper. Um, so I know that can be done a number of different ways, but I feel very strongly that um, participation is is really crucial, whatever that looks like, and and acknowledging different personalities and learning styles. Um, so you know that's not necessarily getting up and and giving you know huge um, uh, uh, huge lectures during the class, uh, but participating in other ways too, comments and um, of all varieties. Yeah, I um I have 30% of my classes class participation and that includes a couple of mini assignments and then the paper is 70%. But for me class participation is so important. I I would hate to just put it onto a, you know a paper because this is where you really see the students number one they're practicing their advocacy in in a relaxed setting. Um and they're also really experiencing such different perspectives. You know, I have um, vegan environmentalist students in my class and I have hunters. And so learning how to communicate and effectively um, advocate for your side is all part of the experience. And so for me, I think class participation and it keeps the class so, so much fun um, because you I, I again, it's just a very non-traditional course for me, and I want them to really have that good experience. So, class participation is incredibly important, and uh, I think they come away from it uh, better students. Yeah, I agree. I think participation is really important, and again, it's it's teaching them the skills that lawyers need, right? And so, trying to help them understand that we're trying to create a safe space for them to talk. So there are different barriers for our students talking. So some are just shy um, and sometimes the participation grade counts that helps. Sometimes it doesn't. And some people are painfully shy or they're, they're worried about how they're going to be judged and sort of Shelby's example, right? The vegan might not want the hunter to hear what they're going to say or vice versa. And so trying to figure out ways um, to have them speak and then and model, right? good and appropriate sort of reaction. So sometimes I have students debate something and take the opposite side. I put them on the opposite side of what people might assume that they would be on. And, and it really, you know, it opens their minds and it, and it um, helps them understand how it feels, um, you know, to be in these awkward situations and to want to be treated respectfully. Um, for the really, really shy, so one of the things I do for participation is I say, I don't care what you say. Right. I'm not judging what you say. I'm grading that you talked. So yeah. all you have to do is say something in the class and you get the points for the class to try to make it easier for the shy students. Um, and then sometimes I do different kinds of exercises, right, where they're in a group um, and I'll ask someone to be the reporter. You know, so giving someone a role helps shy students. Right. That's a way if they know what's expected of them and they know what they're supposed to do and they have time to sort of do it, then they can do it. So some people have, you know, students on call um, and that's a way to get people to participate. So, yeah, there are a number of ways to sort of think about what's getting in the way of people participating and then try to address some of those things. And there are always still going to be people who talk more and people who talk less. Um, and so sometimes I'll just call on people if it doesn't feel heavy handed. So, you know, there are some folks we haven't heard from. And so I'd like to hear some other perspectives. And so I'm just going to, and that sort of, you know, put people on notice. So I'm going to start calling on folks just so we can hear other voices, right? So they know why I'm doing it. So they're not being punished, um, but it gives them a chance. And again, like Josh said, people have things on their mind, they're thinking, and they have things to contribute. It's just trying to make a pathway to make it easier for them to, to do that contribution. Kathy, really quick, one thing that's fascinating to me is when I was in law school, when I was in law school, uh, we did not have, you know, we took handwritten notes um, of lectures. And so now, you know, when I see someone in their computer just typing the whole time, I tell them the first day of class, I say, 
you you do not need to be typing. This is, you know, I want to see your eyes. I want to see that you're participating. And so it really does make them pay attention, at least the way I teach it. Because, you know, it just fascinates me how sometimes you can't even see their face because they're just typing. You can hear them typing. But again, it keeps them engaged. Yeah, there are definitely times I say, we're going to have a conversation now. We're shifting. So um, I'm not lecturing. Like, so let so you can actually close your computers and we're going to talk. Right. And then it's like, okay, now we're going to go back to some case analysis so you can open your computers again. But yeah, I think, um, again, letting them know what you're trying, what you're asking of them, why and how to help them get there. Students really actually want to do what you're asking them to do because they're you're the teacher. Right. So they tend to want to accommodate that. And the more that you can be clear about those goals and why, I think the easier it is for them to, to help. I would just add, leaning on the litigation side of it, there's a sort of structure to voir dire where you have your um, active participants who voluntarily speak up. And there's a few ways to get other people who aren't sort of the natural communicators to communicate and contribute sometimes by directly calling on them and then asking the group writ large what they think of that opinion, which usually gets a quieter person to, again, articulate or expand upon their opinions um, or their analysis or whatever it is. So I, I think there's there are good ways to get the quieter people to participate meaningfully. And sometimes it might start with you having to call on them directly or mention that you haven't heard from them directly or what have you. But usually once the conversation starts flowing, they they become much more active participants. Regarding the grading of participation in particular, I think it's a little different based on the structure of the course that I use since mine kind of relies almost entirely on communication of that nature where they, they have to sort of speak back and forth with each other and they're doing exercises where they have to participate. But I think you have to incorporate it in some way at minimum saying this will bump your grade one direction or the other um, if you're an outlier, because I agree no matter what kind of course you teach, communication is is critical and the class participation is critical. Thank you all so much for your comments. Uh, I'd like to segue now towards a conversation of incorporating experiential components into a non-experiential course. So it sounds obviously like participation is very important and it can be difficult to get some students to participate in classes. So I wanna know your thoughts around incorporating those exper experiential components, um, possibly things such as visiting a zoo or a sanctuary so students can help conceptualize the type of work that they might be doing once they graduate and are in the working world. And if you think that that could help increase participation as they get out of the classroom and kind of into the real world. Um, I'm happy to go. So we have uh, a couple of, um, I guess, quote unquote, sanctuaries uh, in the DFW area where I am. I'm in Dallas. And then we also have the amazing Black Beauty Ranch, um, which is part of, uh, it's an HSUS sanctuary. It's about two hours away. So I have tried very hard um, with our university to get a field trip and allow it for one of the classes. Um, because especially when we talk about private ownership of exotics, Big Cat Public Safety Act, um, Texas has its fair share of these animals. And university has never allowed me to do it because of liability. But um, during COVID, I was, you know, getting a little bit into guest speakers. Um, you know, I was able to get a ton of um, different types of, hey, can we just zoom into your sanctuary? Can you tell us, you know, can you show us some of your jaguars, your tigers and so forth? Um, and so we have some great recordings that are in my bank that I'm able to use. So um, I've also tasked them with it for extra credit, because as we all know, so many of our students now do moot court competitions or they have interviews and they're gonna inevitably miss a class. 
But when they've missed a couple, um, I have a policy where if you go and I have a list of places and then just write a one page paper on it. What did you see? What did you think? What did you learn from the courses? So although we can't go as a class and I'm still working on that with them, um, I definitely tell them to do it either as extra credit or they zoom in. Um, for our wildlife class, I had a wildlife rehabber come in with um, some very, very, very tiny possums. Um, I've had animal cruelty investigators come in. I had the attorney that tried the Stickland v. Medlin case, which is a Supreme Court Texas case that says animal animals are just property. Um, so, you know, there's so many. And I'm very fortunate in my day job that I know a lot of these people. But if you ask guest speakers, they are so excited to come. And now with Zoom, it's very easy. So again, it goes to breaking up the class. I, students just light up um, when you have people come in. And I found it to be really helpful when teaching the materials. Yeah, I'll just plus one the the guest teachers. That's something that um, I feel like uh, Nancy has done a really good job of um, in our class coordinating some uh, some people with different types of experiences to share with students, and they seem really excited about that. Um, so so doing in class activities that are that sort of shake things up and are a little different than um, just the traditional case analysis can be sort of a way to include some experiential. Uh, components to the class, I guess, without necessarily having to visit a sanctuary or other establishment. Thank you so much. That actually segues perfectly into the next question that I wanted to ask, which is, how do you go about picking a guest speaker to come in to speak to your class? And also, should you tend to moder uh, monitor for political content? And also, if there are any resources uh, or people with which to connect if you need help finding a guest speaker? I mean, I think starting with, for, for those working in the animal protection field already, sort of mining your colleagues for people who might want to um, come in and talk to students about specific things they do is a really great starting place. Um, uh, drawing on resources like these, um, you know, sort of like-minded folks that you know from, from your practice um, uh, and keeping in mind that people could come via Zoom in, in this day and age and not necessarily in person. Um, uh, that worked well for us at the beginning of this semester. So um, that's just a starting starting point. In terms of political content, I'll just say, I always give a warning <laughs> before they speak, you know, and I, I just try to tell people, listen, you know, especially for example, in the Stickland v. Medlin case, I mean, uh, you know, the plaintiff's attorney, now he calls himself a so-called communist, but, you know, I try to explain to them that, you know, this is their point of view. And so obviously they're going to be biased to a certain extent. Um, we had a great debate on fair chase hunting um, versus canned hunting in Texas. We have so many canned hunts. And so, you know, giving that kind of disclaimer um, ahead of time is just always helpful. And I would just say this too, in terms of content, um, I'm, I'm sure Josh might or might not have this, but when you have animal cruelty issues, I always try to issue some kind of warning um, ahead of time as well, if there's going to be some graphic content or things we're, that we're going to be talking about. But I let them talk, you know, and I just tell people ahead of time, just fair warning that, you know, that this is their view. Um, and it also goes to their experience, right? And I think that's so important. I wouldn't want to muzzle that. Um, me, on the other hand, being the professor, I've got to be a little more tame, but I think for them, as long as you give them a warning, um, I don't see that being a problem. Uh, I haven't used any guest speakers yet, but I will say that some of the student feedback that I've received has been that the students believe they would benefit from uh, some additional personal experience stories of mine, which I think came up earlier in this discussion that students enjoy hearing about uh, their professor's personal experience. And I think there are additional parties who could be useful guest speakers who serve 
other roles, for example, forensic veterinarians in my course is something that comes to mind um, that could probably enhance the student's learning experience as well. So it's definitely something I'm I'm considering, but I haven't done it yet. Yeah, I think guest speakers uh, can do so many things. So as Nancy suggested, right, it helps networking. Um, it can bring in components to the class that you aren't as, as experienced in, right, um, bring in a new perspective. But it also is real. I mean, I've been teaching a really long time, and I can't tell you how many times I've said something in class, and then a guest speaker has said something, and the students are like, wow. And they they just hear it differently when you bring in an expert, right? Even if it's sort of um, sort of supporting what you've already been trying to say, it's just a different. It truly is like a slice of experience, and students react to it differently. They hear it differently and can absorb the information differently. So it's I think it's always valuable, and I think it's appropriate to bring in people with different you know varying kinds of perspectives, which is helpful. And I think yeah, we can give sort of warnings, it's useful to know at each school and schools are evolving these policies now, right? Are you at a public institution, a private institution? Do you, do you have first amendment because you're in a public school or do you not? And then what is the policy? And certainly post Gaza and, you know, people getting fired from their jobs, this is something to take seriously. Um, but I think it's it's relatively easy to say, I'm not advocating a political perspective. I'm not teaching you what to think. I'm teaching you how to think. Right. And so I want to expose you to a whole bunch of things and we have to learn how to disagree respectfully, those kinds of things. Um, I will say there are a few people uh, who uh, I know who I wouldn't invite as guest speakers. Right. Because it just wouldn't be appropriate in a number of different ways. Right. Doing great work, but in the ways in which they might engage with students, it wouldn't be so helpful. Right. And so um and just thinking about guest speakers as sort of a slice of experience. Um, and I'll say to um, to Shelby's point, it's challenging to get field uh, authorization for field trips. And so at one of the schools we were at, we said, it's it's not required, we're setting it up, we're gonna pay for the tickets and we'll meet you there on Saturday, right? Um, and you guys can carpool. So we're not dealing with buses, we're not dealing with all the liability issues. Um, and we talked to the students about it, like, does that seem useful? Do you want to do it? And then that's kind of how we arranged the organization. And we tried to, you know, you have to be sensitive to other other courses, right? Other classes and other obligations, work and family, those kinds of things. Um, and it's sort of the same thing when you're choosing a speaker, right? So what do they sort of represent um, in terms of lawyering, in terms of, you know, movement work, in terms of whatever, and and then sort of share that with students in context, right? Thank you. So I wanna pause here because we have about seven minutes. I would love for people to send, participants to send in questions they have. I see one that we have already in the chat. So I'll go ahead and ask that, but please feel free to send more in. So this question says, for those who said they teach both animal law and wildlife law in separate or combined classes, do you find different levels of interest or use or use different teaching methods of, for the two subjects? That's a great question. Um, in my animal law class, I definitely, it's a bit more traditional, but in the wildlife law class, because of the textbook I use, um, we definitely take up kind of case studies. So it is very different. Um, for whatever reason, my wildlife law class is a bit more popular in the sense that I think it's spring semester, a lot of um, 3Ls take it um, and they enjoy it because maybe they already have a job waiting for them and, you know, they they find the class interesting. Um, but you definitely can break it up. And sometimes there is a bit of overlap, but um, it just goes back to whatever works for you. But I definitely teach them, um, I would say, a little bit differently. And it works for both. Yeah. And I'll just echo that. So I've taught clinic, I've taught uh, exam classes, I've taught paper classes, I've taught a reading group, I've taught pretty much all the different options you have in a law school. Um, and the nice thing is you can do you can do so much, right, in all kinds of different ways. And there's there's a lot of angles um, and students are attracted to different options. So having more than one kind of option is really, really helpful. And having the other thing that sort of intersectionality, letting students know in one right, there's you're going to get a flavor of this. We're not going to go deep into it, but there is this over you know intersection that I want to call your attention to, and that kind of helps 
students learn to begin to spot that on their own um, and also to help the people in the building beyond you see these intersections. And, and you know, I love it when I have students say, come back and say, oh, I raised this in a class or a professor raised this in a class because now they sort of see that you're there and it infuses this animal law conversation a little more broadly. And that's just phenomenal. Thank you. So I see we have about four minutes left. I want to be mindful of everyone's time. So I'll close this out with one final question. And that is on the topic of balancing law versus advocacy. So my question is, how can you satisfy the administration's desire for a balanced course and cover perspectives from agriculture without being disingenuous to your own personal beliefs? I think it's really important to acknowledge at the start of the, any course you're teaching on animal law, your own biases and where you're coming from. Um, and, you know, sort of acknowledging the diversity of perspectives that we've talked about. Um, Shelby, that's really interesting, the sort of um, dialogues with hunters and things you've had in your class. Um, I've seen some similar things. Um, but so I think encouraging, you know, really taking a look at your syllabus and making sure you've got some diverse perspectives included in there um, and being open to student thoughts <laughs> um, from those variety of, of perspectives and others um, is, a, is a good starting point. You know, for me, this is the hardest because my day job, I'm an advocate, I'm the executive director of the Texas Humane Legislation Network. So I definitely leave that at the door. And I see my role when discussions happen, um, not necessarily being a referee, but kind of guiding where it's going, definitely making sure it's respectful. Um, but I, I just, I have not had a bad experience with people with incredibly different points of view coming in a room and, be a, and being able to discuss and advocate their views in a respectful manner. So I'm really proud of that. And, um, but it is, it is the hardest part for me uh, because I have some strong opinions, but um, I definitely, that's not my role in that, in that classroom. And for me, I have to, I have to put it aside. So, um, but it, I, I think it, it's so great when sometimes we see our political leaders not being able um, to come together and make decisions, but yet in a law class, um, in Dallas, Texas, we can have totally different points of view and still have respectful conversations. Yeah, I I don't um, I don't view my role so much as a, as an advocate role as one in which I'm trying to help students learn how to think and and deconstruct concepts that they probably a lot of times never even considered before. Sometimes the case law itself that you're using can be very useful in doing that. So uh, the very first case we used to start my course in the semester is a an animal crush case. And there's discussion within the, the majority opinion of the case in which they're addressing defense's argument that this is really the same thing as extermination methods used for mice, since the case applies to mice. Um, there's similar discussions in cases related to farm animals or in cases related to hunting, um, or as Shelby mentioned, can versus free, fair chase hunting. So I think a lot of that sort of happens organically and students can think about things, um, including in the discussions that they're having with each other, they're sort of sometimes thinking about them on the spot and hopefully thinking about them more long-term, uh, things that they had never really considered before. But you don't necessarily um, need to come in with a particular agenda, I think. I think the main agenda is sort of getting them to think about this in the first place. And I'll just add really quickly that sometimes I think it's helpful if people are getting grief to push back on the idea of balance because we don't talk about that in torts, right? We don't talk about that in other courses. And we certainly don't talk about um, a human rights course giving other time, giving, you know, class time to the abusers, right? To people committing genocide or what have you. So sometimes I think animal courses get put in a different box and people are like, whoa, 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 you can't talk about the animals without talking about why it's okay to do these things. It's like, you can't actually do that, right? Because this is a course about 
whatever it's about, right? And so I think sometimes it's okay if you have to, if you're getting some grief from the administration to push back and say, this is an animal law course, we're focusing on animals. If it was elder law, we'd focus on elders. If it was children's law, we'd focus on children. We're just doing it the same as other courses. And so when you talk about balance, what do you actually mean, right? And then you can, uh, so I think the things that we're saying, I 100% agree with, um, and sometimes people, I have definitely seen people teaching that are teaching like an advocate, right? And it's like, well, that that, that may get you in trouble. Um, so, so yeah, just trying to know what your role is, what you're trying to do with the students and how to get there. But every once in a while, I think people get a little unfairly uh, targeted for animal courses. So we can help with that. Can I just add one thing quickly um, to what Dean Hessler just mentioned? Uh, and that is that not only can teaching like an advocate possibly get you into trouble, but I think it's probably more likely to close some minds that might otherwise be receptive to, you know, coming to this themselves, mm -hmm. if they're just hearing you sort of get up there and pitch, um, mm -hmm. rather than letting this happen more organically, then I think their defenses are going to go up and they're immediately going to take the other side, especially with law students. 100%. Thank you all so much. I see that we're just past the hour. So I want to end here and thank all of our panelists for their time and their wonderful insight today. I'd also like to thank all of the participants for joining us. We hope that you found this discussion informative. And as a reminder, our next webinar will be on April 10th at 6 p.m. Uh, we certainly hope that you can come join us and there will be more information that we'll send out regarding that as we get closer to the event. Um, also, please feel free if uh, if anyone is interested in becoming a panelist for a future webinar, please feel free to let myself or Dean Hessler know. I also wanted to tee up that we are having a discussion about potentially hosting an in-person event this summer, uh, sometime, possibly sometime around June or July. And that event would be intended to help people build and adjust their courses. So if this is something you would be interested in joining, please feel free to let myself or Dean Hessler know. Thank you all again for participating today, and we hope to see you at the next event.